On behalf of the National Academy of Sciences, I'd like to welcome you. I'd like to welcome the scientific community, members of the public. I think we can all agree that the COVID-19 pandemic reminds us of how interconnected the entire world is, both within our own species and in our interactions uh, with other species. Today's workshop is about another category of species that are very important to human existence, the bees. The bees are the number one pollinating species on the planet, and one single species of bee, the honeybee Apis mellifera, contributes approximately one-third of our food, our agricultural productivity, every year. If you think your supermarket looks picked over now, you should Google what a Whole Foods would look like without honeybee pollinated food, which they stage every year on National Pollinators Week. The work that you're going to hear today in today's symposium has its roots in two events that occurred in 2006. First was the publication of a National Academy of Sciences National Research Council report on the status of pollinators, which sounded the alarm. The second event was the publication of the paper describing the sequencing and analysis of the honeybee genome in nature by a consortium of over 100 scientists from around the world. That first honeybee genome cost $7 million to sequence. Now, less than 20 years later, it's about $100 per honeybee genome. And one of the leading honeybee genomicists is one of our speakers today, Amro Zayed. Both of these events occurred in 2006, but of course, the work started several years earlier. That's what we scientists do. We look over the horizon to anticipate new problems and then plan ahead to try to be ready. These two projects, which culminated in 2006, tur uh, turned out to be very prescient um, when uh, just a few months later, 2007, was the first report of colony collapse disorder, a mysterious disappearance of large numbers of colonies, a problem, honeybee death colonies, problem that has persisted for now almost two decades. But the community was better prepared as a result of those two projects the publication of the NRC report and the sequencing of the honeybee genome, providing concepts, tools, and in the case of the NRC report, actually sounding the alarm that bees were a threat, were threatened. Today, you're going to be here from some of the leading scientists working on bee health. There are many more that could have been presenting here today. This is one of the most active areas in the study of social insects. So I hope you enjoy the talks today. The format will be each speaker has 20 minutes. If they end before 20 minutes, there'll be some time for a few questions before the next talk. If not, we do have a full 10 minute question answer session at the end for all the speakers. The National Academy of Sciences has a very packed schedule of workshops today. So we're going to be ending um, right on time. So you have a mechanism for how to send the questions and we'll be happy to take them. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Professor Nancy Moran from the University of Texas at Austin. And her title is The Distinctive Bee Microbiome and Its Role in Bee Health. Nancy? Great, thanks, Jean. Um, let me get going here. Okay. Right. Um, I'm really pleased to be in this uh, little little symposium today. It's an incredibly important topic. And thank you, Jean, for organizing this. And thank you to the other speakers and the staff for making everything work so well, at least so far. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the gut microbiome and bee health. And this is something that I've been studying and my lab group has been studying for about um, since about 2006, which was a very important year, as Jean pointed out. And we've made a lot of discoveries about the importance of the gut microbiome in the biology of honeybees and in some other bees. So microbiomes play key roles in lots of different settings in the environment in soil and water. Um, we use microbiomes in all kinds of contexts. They're important in animal guts as well, including in the human gut. Um, and the thing I wanna look at today is, are they important in the honeybee gut? And if so, can we manipulate them or protect them in a way that might help honeybee health? So this all started in 2006, a year that um, Gene has um, already usefully pointed out as being very important for honeybees. He pointed out that colony collapse started that year, the 2007. The honeybee genome was published. 
Um, it's also um, when next-gen sequencing, this cheap high-throughput um, DNA sequencing started. So a consortium of people got together and um, when the first um, major bee colony deaths were happening and the community got together and tried to use the next-gen sequencing to identify whether there was a particular pathogen that had just invaded um, and perhaps was the cause of this. To make a long story short, there was no particular pathogen, but instead, an interesting discovery that um, I noticed, so my team analyzed the bacterial sequences from this, and was that every single worker bee had the same five to eight bacterial species um, in the gut, that these made up more than 95% of the gut microbiota, and that these only lived in bee guts. They, didn't, they don't live out in the environment. These are not just environmental bacteria. These are particular to bee guts. So much as the human gut microbiota is made up of restricted organisms that live nowhere else, the same is true of honeybees. And let's see if this works. So over here on the, on the right is some of our early data looking at each, each row is a single bee looking at the composition of the gut bacteria in that bee. Each color represents a different species. So you can see there's this constancy of these particular species, and these are species that only live in bees. So I thought that's really interesting. These are important to bees. These are part of their biology. Globally, all honeybee workers have this same set of bacteria. So we did a lot more sequencing, but what really allowed this um, work to move forward is that it turned out that these species could be cultured in the lab in pure culture. So a couple of very talented researchers, Walden Kwong and Philip Engel, were in my lab at the time and, and got these things into culture. This enables a huge amount of other kinds of rigorous experiments on this system. First of all, you can describe the species formally, which requires culturing for bacteria, sequence genomes very easily, do experiments on the effects of particular strains on the host, experiments on host specificity, can they move between different bee species. We can share strains among labs, put them in culture collections, and we can develop genetic tools to manipulate their genomes and understand better how they're interacting with hosts. So um, among the findings we've had from this is that this gut community is actually very organized spatially. So the bee gut depicted here has a bunch of different compartments, and these are mostly in the hindgut of the bee, which consists of the ileum and the rectum, and there's different communities in those two regions. And so these um, bacteria are acquired within the colony when the new adults emerge from the pupil stage. They acquire these bacteria from their sisters, from other workers within the colony. And it's also quite a large bacterial community, about 10 to the ninth bacteria per worker bee, which is a substantial number of bacteria for the size of a bee. So um, the experiments we've done, we've done a lot of kinds of experiments, but they mostly fall into this kind of strategy where we can take microbiota-free hosts, bees that have no microbiota, they've newly emerged, inoculate them with known strains or full microbiota from hindgut of hive bees, and then look at the effects on hosts and compare them to control bees. Or we can take colonized hosts, that is bees from hives that have a microbiota, disrupt those, return to the hive environment, and monitor what are the effects on bee health, what are the effects on the community of bacteria in the gut. So in general, those are our strategies. This is showing um, just how we, how we obtain the microbiota-free bees. These are normal bees. They develop in hives. We pull the pupae from the frames. They emerge in the lab. And the new adult is microbiota-free and can be inoculated experimentally to obtain notobiotic bees, that is bees that we know exactly what's in the gut. This is a, a micrograph showing the cross-section of the ileum. It has these folds, longitudinal folds, so the cross-section looks like this. The red, it's just a DNA stain that shows the B cell nuclei, and this bluish color is um, Snodgrassella alvi, my favorite um, species occurring in the bee gut. It's closely related to Neisseria, which can be a pathogen or commensal of, of mammals. Um, and it lines the epithelial layer within the ileum. And in naturally exposed bees or in bees that are mono-inoculated in the lab with a single strain, we get robust, the same robust colonization. So how does the gut microbiota affect honeybees? Well, it turns out that if you compare microbiota-free bees to conventional microbiota, that is the full community, there, there are a lot of major differences. The, Microbiota-free bees are abnormal in a number of ways. Um, they don't gain weight as well following emergence. They're less sensitive to sucrose and they don't feed as much, which might explain why they gain less weight. Their insulin signaling is very different. Their immune system is very different. So there are many effects on their physiology. The development of the gut is, um, is under, it's underdeveloped. 
when they're microbiota free. So they need a microbiota to be normal worker bees. It turns out that one of the major effects of these micro, the gut microbiota on bees is to protect them against opportunistic pathogens. And we've done many different experiments. This is one example from graduate student Margaret Steele's work. If you look at microbiota free versus conventional microbiota, the microbiota free bee are unable to clear themselves of a pathogen, so a serratious strain um, that is a pathogen of bees. Um, they build up to very large numbers and cause the death of the bee. They kill the bees. Whereas the conventional microbiota prevents the invasion of the serratia and clears them so that they're basically free of the pathogen after a few days. So one question is, so bees have a normal microbiota, that's great, and let's just leave it there. But a question is, are we sometimes doing things to bees that disrupts the microbiota and affects their health as a consequence? And one kind of experiment we've done with this is to take bees, treat them, expose them to something, put them back in the hive and see if they have a lower survivorship compared to control bees that didn't experience this treatment, and also look at the microbiota and how it changes over time. So this is um, the, the first work of this type was done by former postdoc Casey Raymond, um, and she looked at the effect of tetracycline exposure on the bee microbiota. So this is an antibiotic. It's commonly used in beekeeping against the bacterial pathogens that cause a larval disease called fowl brood. But um, of course, we expect an antibiotic to affect the gut microbiota. That those are bacteria. We expect antibiotics to affect them. And it turns out it does. It results in smaller gut communities with a very altered species composition because some species are more um, susceptible to the antibiotic than others. And this per perturbation is persistent over the life of the adult worker bee. So it, it doesn't, it doesn't um, go back to normal very quickly. And another result is that, it that the tetracycline exposed bees have lower survivorship. They die more often in the same hive next to sisters that were not exposed to tetracycline. And in the lab, if we um, challenge them with a serratia pathogen, the tetracycline exposure causes them to have a low ability to resist that pathogen compared to ones that were not exposed to tetracycline. Here's some similar experiments that were done with glyphosate. Glyphosate is a widely used herbicide. It disrupts the shikimate pathway, which is present in most plants, that's why it's an herbicide, but also present in most bacteria and fungi. And so the shikimate pathway is important for making essential amino acids. Animals don't have this pathway, so those are almost the only organisms not expected to be affected by this molecule. So glyphosate exposure, so this is work done by Eric Mota, now Dr. Mota, who did this as part of his dissertation. Glyphosate exposure reduces several beneficial gut bacteria in hive bees. So Stangracella, my favorite, Bifidobacterium, a particular group of lactobacillus, which are all normal core gut bacteria, all are decreased by exposure to glyphosate. And it increases pathogen susceptibility in the lab. So again, if we challenge them with a serratia pathogen, they have very low survivorship if they've been exposed to glyphosate. So possible uses of um, the engineered bee gut bacteria um, well, one is just as a research tool. We can use these bacteria for studies of the gut community. It turns out that it's useful possibly for studies of bee genetics, but maybe we can do something useful for bees with it as well, improving their behavior as, as pollinators or their biology in some way. Um, and in particular, maybe we can help their resistance to natural enemies. So for the first use, um, these are just some of the gut bacteria that have been uh, modified to express a fluorescent protein, and it's a good research tool that enables us to visualize the interactions of the community within the gut. So here's Snodgrassella colonizing these folds within the ileum wall. Here's Serratia, this pathogen that just invades the entire gut and goes to very large numbers when it's by itself. When it's co-inoculated, the, the Snodgrassella appears to suppress the Serratia expansion, and so you get less of this red color, the Serratia cells expanding in the gut. So that's one use is just as a tool to understand these communities and follow their interactions. But can these engineered gut bacteria protect bees actually in hives? And some of the main problems in bee health, probably the main problem at the moment in the US at least, is this thing called Varroa mite. It is it an example of how the world is connected. This jumped over from a different species in the same genus Apis um, and jumped over to Apis mellifera and now has spread around the world and is a huge problem. It interacts with these um, RNA viruses. We all know about RNA viruses. And um, 
this deformed wing virus is one example of that. The mite spreads the virus. It also pierces the cuticle of the bee and introduces it into the body cavity. And so there's sort of an in synergistic interaction between these that can cause colonies to fail. Here's a mite on the abdomen just to give a sense of scale. So can engineered gut bacteria protect bees? Um, so the strategy here, um, this is work of Sean Leonard, um, a graduate student in the lab. The strategy is that we engineer the gut symbiont to continually produce double-stranded RNA that targets a viral or a mite gene. And this double-stranded RNA is taken up by the host, by the bee, and activates RNA interference, which is an antiviral immune pathway widely conserved across many animals and plants. And then this will destroy the virus or kill the mite. In the case of the mite, it's actually activating the RNAi pathway, RNA interference pathway of the mite. In the case of the virus, it's activating the pathway in the bee. Well, it turns out that Sean's work shows that this actually um, works, um, at least in the lab. And so that's all we know so far. So he um, designed um, these constructs, this um, engineered symbiont, and this was Snagracella albi. He designed it to um, counter the virus with anti-deformed wing virus, um, double-stranded RNA, and found that he can have a higher percentage of surviving bees compared to those, compared to controls that had a different construct that didn't target the virus. And on the mites, he also showed that if you look at mite survival, so here, this is mite survival, not bee survival, um, that mite survival is much lower when it feeds on bees that have this symbiont with the anti-mite double-stranded RNA. So at least from these lab trials, it's a promising um, result that suggests that possibly one could limit the spread of these pests through um, some engineering of a gut symbiont that lives inside the bee. So just as a summary slide, um, for honeybees, there's a distinctive gut microbiota. It's key for their development. It's important for their biology. Um, it's important for nutrition, which I didn't talk much about, and pathogen resistance to both bacteria and other pathogens. Environmental factors, such as exposure to chemicals, can impact the gut microbiota, and that can have consequences for bee health. So we need to understand more about this so that we can limit negative effects on gut microbiota. And there's a possibility to improve or pro to protect or improve microbiota as a strategy for improving bee health. So we can either take steps to make sure they have a good natural microbiota or possibly use some kind of probiotics or engineered strains to do that, sorry. Um, and then one question is, are honeybees unique in their dependence on a, honey, on a healthy microbiota? Are we just noticing it in, hun in honeybees because we study them a lot? They're an insect that is well studied compared to almost any other insect. And we know recently that many different insects, including other wild pollinators, are under threat. Many of their populations are declining. And that happens to be true for bumblebees. Bumblebees <coughs> are undergoing declines, sometimes to the point of distinction. These are wild species that are native in different regions of the world. And in different parts of the world, they're undergoing declines. And actually, the very first evidence that the gut microbiota um, was protective, protected bees against pathogens, was actually a study done in uh, and bumblebees um, by Halka Koch and Paul Schmidt Hempel, published in PNAS in 2011. It showed that this, the socially transmitted gut microbiota protected them against intestinal trypanosomatid parasites. So this suggests that possibly this is important in a wider set of bees. And um, in fact, bumblebees and honeybees share related microbiota. So that apparently this has ancient evolutionary origins that has evolved with this group of bees for their whole evolution about 80 million years. So possibly this is a key part that we really should be thinking about in protecting these insects, um, both the domesticated honeybee and wild species. Okay, with that, I wanna yeah, um, just acknowledge some of the people in the lab. I mentioned most of these as I went along. There's also some other people who were in the lab in the past, Philip Engel, Vince Martinson, Halka Koch, Zaki Sabri, and some collaborators at UT. And at the bottom is my funding. So um, with that, I don't know what the timing is, um, but Gene must be keeping track so we can see if there's time for questions. Yes, thank you very much. And we do have time for questions. Um, I have a couple of them here. Uh, first, a general question that I'll just take the answer. Uh, I'll answer because I think it helps for the whole symposium. Someone is asking um, whether there's any evidence that 5G networks affect the health of bees. 
Uh, the answer is there is no such evidence for that. Our current understanding of the main threats to bee health are the so-called four Ps. Nancy mentioned one, parasites. The other three are pathogens, poor nutrition, and pa parasites, pathogens, poor nutrition, and... Pesticides. Pesticides, oh. thank you. Our next speaker is Professor Alexandra Harmon Threat from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. The title of her talk is From the Ground Up, Insights from the Nests of Native Bees. Alex? Uh, thank you first to Dean and the National Academies for having me speak today. I'm pretty excited about this. Um, and I'm going to hopefully try and transition us from the hive into the nests of native bees. I think it's important for us to orient ourselves a little bit. Um, most uh, honeybees are very charismatic organisms and they have really captured our imaginations. Um, most of the speakers today are talk, you know, speaking about honeybees specifically. And I think that the public most often when they're thinking about bees are thinking about honeybees. Even just this week during Earth Week, Google was highlighting quote unquote the bee um, and almost all of the facts that they presented were about honeybees. But it's important uh, this, what I refer to sometimes as bee blindness, um, really ignores the fact that honeybees actually differ, differ in a lot of really important ways from most native species or wild species, um, and prevents us sometimes from thinking about how some of these native species might be responding. So just as a way of reminding everyone, um, native bees, um, there are over 20,000 estimated species of native bees, with 4,000 here in, in the United States. And they're also very critical for pollination. Um, we know that honeybees do a lot of pollination in agricultural systems, but native bees are just as capable and sometimes superior in some situations at pollinating native, crop, at pollinated crops. They're also critical for pollinating native plants and ensuring ecosystem stability. If they're not out making the seeds for many of these flowering forbs, then those uh, plants that other organisms depend on, other birds, um, other insects, and other areas of life, they're not gonna be, um, of those plants are uh, not gonna be available. They also, honeybees also vary um, pretty significantly in a lot of key like history traits. Something like sociality. Jean at the very beginning of this, um, at the introduction mentioned, uh, we're gonna be talking about social insects, but actually most bees are not social. Many of them are solitary. And that means a single female is going to be provisioning a nest as you can see in the bottom left corner. Also size, honeybees in terms of the size of most bees are actually quite large. Um, in this image, you can see the smallest known species in North America, Perdita minima, on the eye of one of the largest, but most bees are gonna be significantly smaller than honeybees. When we're thinking about how they might be responding to threats um, and their health, size is obviously very important. And the one that I'm gonna be spending the most time today on is where they nest. Um, we often talk about hives for honeybees. Most native bees actually nest below ground in soils. And this is over 80%, probably about 85% of native bees in the United States are gonna be nesting below ground. And that means when we're thinking again about what's, how, something, how they're gonna be responding, these things are critical to take into consideration. Now, some of the main threats, um, G mentioned them as the four Ps, but I also like to include climate change as something that's really critical for them. Um, some of the main threats are going to be things like climate change, land use change, and parasites and pathogens. And these have some significant effects on uh, bee population numbers. But all of these intersect in really interesting and meaningful ways with these life history traits that I mentioned previously. They also can mediate some of the interactions between these different threats. So for example, um, the types of parasites and pathogens that a bee might experience is gonna be very dependent on where they make their nest. Um, but then climate actually influences how rapidly the parasites and pathogens spread. And so there's gonna be a lot of interesting things that are happening um, that, that can happen, I guess, within uh, these life history traits. And most importantly, bees spend the vast majority of their life cycle inside of their nests or in contact with nesting materials. And the natural mortality while they're nesting, nesting can exceed 80%. And so when we're thinking about how they're responding, responding to different threats, their resiliency, ignoring the fact that they're spending most of their time in the nest 
or not studying it is really limiting our ability to help improve conservation efforts. Soil is creating a literal black box for us understanding these kind of massive demographic, demographic shifts uh, that might be happening in um, foreign bee communities. Now, we are here today to talk a lot about kind of an update a little bit of what has happened since the status of North American. Uh, Pollinators in North America was published in 2006. Or, um, and one of the things that they highlight is really critical for native pollinators is this managing um, of habitats and landscapes to provide necessary resources. And that's really what I focus on in my work, is trying to understand how land use change in particular, which I refer to as both the destruction of habitat and also the restoration of habitat. Now, uh, to orient you in this photograph, on the left side where you see slightly more yellow colors, that's actually an, um, a restored prairie uh, um, immediately adjacent to a soybean field that's on the right. Now, what that means is that there's going to be a lot of interaction between these two habitats. Um, the pollinators or insects that are living in the native prairie are going to be moving into the agricultural field. Um, pests may be moving into the prairie, as well as um, agricultural drift or byproducts that might be moving between the two habitats. So when we restore habitat as a way to conserve pollinators, we have to remember some really important things about them. They're highly fragmented, which really increases the amount of anthropogenic disturbances that they experience, including things like the number of invasive species that might be occurring in those habitats. They have limited a dispersal of organisms between the habitat. We see reduced food and nesting habitats for bees in these highly fragmented systems, and increased competition and in interactions between organisms. But it's important for us to remember that if we're really trying to push for conservation, we probably need to be looking at the soil beneath our feet. Because this is going to mediate a lot of the um, important interactions that bees are going to be experiencing. Things like the abiotic conditions that are occurring in the soil, biotic interactions with fungi and microbes and other things, as well as plants, the plant community itself, and some of the chemicals that may be existing in these habitats. But ultimately, we almost know nothing still about the restoration of land and how that might affect bees. In a, uh, in a questionnaire that we conducted with some land managers in tall grass prairie habitats, what we found is that they prefer to, um, prefer to restore places that were former agricultural fields that were small and surrounded by agriculture. And if we think about these potential threats that that might in itself cause, uh, for pollinators, this is in some ways a little bit concerning, but we don't have a lot of evidence of what the ultimate effects are. They also use a very large number of management methods to maintain habitats. So most of my work really focuses on this idea of if we build it, will they come? And even going beyond that, I'm more interested in if we build it, will they thrive? Not just will the bees actually move into these habitats that we're creating for their conservation, but are they going to do well there? And I'm going to uh, speak about just two projects today really quickly. The first looking at whether or not we're able to increase nesting and success because that's very key to thriving. But also if we're able to decrease mortality in some way. Um, I'm showing a picture here of natural mortality. This is a praying mantis eating a, a queen bumblebee. But mortality, obviously, increasing success and decreasing mortality are really, nesting success and decreasing mortality are really critical to addressing some of the concerns about native pollinators and native bees um, in natural areas. And the one way to address this is through restoration of habitat, but restoration, uh, restored areas have to be managed. Um, if they aren't managed, many of them will become over, overgrown with uh, weeds and degraded over time. But management can affect a lot of key nesting um, conditions. This includes things like soil temperature, soil moisture and compaction, all of which can affect how many bees are able to live in an area and how successful they are in that place. Some of the common um, management methods used for native pollinators uh, in prairies are burning, haying, and grazing. And in a project uh, with a former student, Brittany Buckles, we were able to try and look at these three um, management techniques uh, simultaneously. In particular, uh, we focus a lot on what's called patch burn grazing, which is 
believed to help reduce the amount of um, impact cattle are having on the land by encouraging them to move rotationally uh, just by applying burning to particular patches of, gra of, 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 of area. So in this diagram, you'll see that the dark green is an area that's recently burned. Um, the cattle move there, they graze that area pretty intensively, and then the, it's allowed to uh, be fallow for a number for two more years, and the cattle can uh, re reduce the amount of uh, time they're spending on that patch of land um, in subsequent years after the burn. What we found really interestingly is that the management method really altered the soil and floral resources um, that are important to bees. So whether or not this, um, in general, burning seemed to do really good things for both the soil quality and uh, the amount of floral resources in the area, and grazing seemed to do some really detrimental things. We also, also saw that soil in itself affected the floral quality index, which is really an index of um, the diversity of plants that are occurring in that site. So with better soil, you're getting better, uh, more diverse plant community, which is uh, obviously important for various reasons to bees. And then lastly, the part that we were really interested in is the effect of, um, that soil had on nesting rate. So as you improve the soil quality, you also seem to see an increase in nesting in those areas. And what this together suggests is that the way we manage a habitat actually intersects by affecting both the floral and the soil nesting resources. And this is really an, um, going to impact the number of bees that are living in that area um, and the number of species that are uh, that are nesting there. And so again we're trying to increase nesting and conservation of native species and so we might need to really consider both soils and the role of human management in that. So I'm going to move really quickly to my second story because I've talked a little bit about how we can increase nesting and success but I also want to discuss how we might decrease mortality. So one of the biggest concerns right now in a lot of these conservation areas is the effect of drift of pesticides into, this, into these adjacent habitats. If you remember from the photo I just showed recent, um, earlier, those, the restored, conserved area is immediately adjacent to the agricultural area, meaning that there is a lot of potential for pesticide drift um, into these con conservation habitats. Um, we know this dust can contain high levels of pesticides like neonicotinoids and contaminants, and that a lot of that is actually remaining in the soils. I also want to remind you briefly that one of the preferred areas for farmers, for uh, land managers to uh, restore are areas that have previously been agricultural habitats, meaning they bring with them whatever their legacy effects from agriculture, including things like DDT that are still present in the soil today. So we started trying to investigate whether or not soil contaminants seem to affect bees survival. And we used two species of um, cavity nesting bees, Osmia and Megachile. Although they're cavity nesting species, many of the species, both of Osmia and of Megachile, do nest in the soil. So I like to emphasize this, that when you look at them under natural conditions, many of them will nest in the soil. And uh, my student, Nick Anderson, painstakingly um, uh, expose these bees in their larval state to very small amounts of neonicotinoids um, for months. Because, oh, sorry, I want to back up because one of the reasons that we actually chose these two species is that they vary a lot in uh, life history traits. Um, they're very different sizes. They have very different development speeds. And they also have slight differences in the way they would construct their nest that might influence how susceptible they are to chemicals that might be existing in the soil. So through cuticular exposure, he placed very small amounts on the um, cuticle of these bees at four different concentrations uh, throughout their development. And we found some very interesting effects. Um, at low and intermediate concentrations, the Osmia female bees actually live longer. In one case, um, throughout our experiment, none of the female bees that were exposed to 15 parts per billion died at all. But we didn't see any differences between any of the treatments for Mega Kylie, and that's again, showing the diff how life history traits might be important and how these process things and how these soil contaminants might affect them in the long term. We also saw some interesting effects on the male megachile bees. So when the bees, uh, the, the highest concentration of the mega of the uh, imidacloprid on exposed to these bees actually seem to increase their survival. 
which is really interesting to think about what happens, what's causing them to increase survival. Um, and I always like to mention that there are fates other than death. Right now, we're only looking at survival, but there are things like memory and fecundity that make a big difference that we um, didn't track. Uh, we did track in this experiment, but I'm not going to present today. And the two things I really want you all to take away from this is that life history matters. And this is, you know, this is something I like to really emphasize, particularly when we're talking about uh, native pollinators um, and solitary bees, because again, we're, most of our basis for understanding and information is honeybees. And even within two species of cavity nesting bees that are actually pretty closely related, their response to these uh, soil contaminant levels actually vary quite a lot. So your life history matters, um, development speed, size, and things like that. But also, uh, cuticular exposure um, in the larval state seems to make a big, um, that bees might experience when they are nesting in the soils actually seems to have a large effect on some of these things like survival. And that's really important to showing that soils matter, right? Where bees nest and what they're being exposed to while they're nesting may have a significant effect um, on the number of bees that we're seeing in the environment and our ability to conserve them. As a follow-up to this study, we started trying to do some experiments in natural areas to see whether or not bees actually are able to avoid this contamination. Do they actually nest in areas uh, that are contaminated with neonicotinoids? Um, in this case, we actually use a different compound, and this is really preliminary, but so far what we're seeing is actually bees seem to, we see more bees nesting in areas that are contaminated. Um, this, the blue is control and the orange is cyanidin treated. Uh, soils, we see more bees nesting in those areas that are contaminated with uh, clothianidin and uh, we have an overall higher capture rate in those areas as well. So if we combine these two uh, different observations together, what, that, what it would suggest is that bees are actually not avoiding those habitats that are, um, that are contaminated and that they may see some increased mortality um, depending on their life history traits. Um, but we have to get past looking at just the exposure uh, that, and observations that we're able to see in nature and start getting to, what, to growth rate. Because as my colleagues have mentioned, if we really want to understand what's causing the declines, we have to move past just these observations um, and start looking at some of the proximate causes of declines of native pollinators. Unfortunately, there are two major things that are limiting this. This includes a lack of information for native species. I, in a recent review that I conducted, 75% of species had no information about their natural uh, nests. And of those that do have them, do have some information, most of the time only a single nest was observed. And on, on the rare occasion where multiple nests were observed, the traits of those nests were actually very different from one another, which, you know, that makes understanding how they're going to respond to some of these threats very challenging. We also lack control for a lot of um, being able to investigate these soil dwelling species. Uh, we have really difficult time tracking things that are really important, their physiology, their fecundity, um, and genetics, the things that uh, some of my other colleagues that work on honeybees have the luxury of doing. And being able to break out of that uh, to hopefully maybe expand into getting them nesting in between panes of glass so we can track some of that would really make a big difference. So ultimately, we have increased some of our understanding of management of contaminants, um, but we have to really start looking at the complete life cycle for a lot of these soil dwelling species to really understand kind of the effects that they're going to be experiencing and making more comprehensive efforts to conserve them. Um, and thank you all for your time. Our final talk is from Professor Christina Grosinger, Pennsylvania State University, and the title of her talk is Bee Health from Genes to Landscapes. Christina. So thank you, Jean, for, um, for inviting me to be part of the session, and thank you to everyone who has uh, joined us today. Um, so the other speakers have done a great job of talking about all the different ways that we can kill bees. So of course there's pathogens, parasites, um, there's stresses from migratory beekeeping practices, um, pesticides, poor nutrition from lack of flowering plants, and also lack of uh, nesting resources for wild bees, and then of course um, climate change. And so my lab has done work on a lot of these different areas, but in the last couple of years we've tried to sort of shift our focus to thinking about 
you know, how do we develop strategies that beekeepers and land managers can use um, that can sort of directly improve um, bee health outcomes. And so this is a photo from David Hackenberg, who is one of our um, beekeepers in Pennsylvania. And I really like this picture because you can sort of you know, feel his despair um, because you know US beekeepers are losing about 30% of their colonies every winter. And a lot of these factors that we've been talking about are really at the landscape scale and are outside of beekeepers control. And so we wanted to know um, what they could do and what land managers can do to sort of improve the situation for bees. So the first story that I will um, tell you about was uh, a study that we did where we looked to see if we could find evidence for locally adapted stocks um, having better survival outcomes in Pennsylvania. And so there's been studies done in Europe um, where bees have a long evolutionary history and there's uh, clear subspecies that are adapted to different ecoregions and they perform better in those ecoregions. Um, and so we wanted to see if there is a similar effect that we could see in the U.S. Um, but the, the challenge is that in the U.S. bees have been introduced, they're moved around a lot for um, pollination services and there's also a lot of sale of a uh, commercial sale of bees across regions. And so this was a study that was um, led by Molly Doki when he was a PhD student in the lab in collaboration with Marianne Frazier. And so we um, got stocks of honeybees that were reared from breeders in northern states and from breeders in southern states. And we put them together in our central Pennsylvania apiaries and we looked at their overwintering survival. And though we were able to um, show that these stocks were genetically distinct, all four of them did equally well in our region. And so we didn't see any effect of, um, of, genetic, of these genetic differences. However, we saw a very strong effect of colony size. So bigger colonies survived better. And we saw a lot of variation among the three apiaries that we used, where one apiary had um, particularly large and, um, colonies and a high survival rate. When we looked at the overall land use patterns surrounding these apiaries, we also saw differences. And interestingly, the apiary that had the best health outcomes was actually the most agricultural. Um, and that's, that's interesting because other studies have shown that on these edges of agricultural lands are a lot of flowering weeds that bees are using for nutrition. Um, this study, however, was not designed to look at land use patterns. This is obviously too small um, a number of, of apiaries to really get at this, but um, this got us starting to think about the effects of nutrition in the landscape and how that might influence bee health. Um, and in the meantime, we were also doing several other studies looking at transcriptional responses of bees to these different stressors and also um, how different diets were affecting uh, the health outcomes of these bees. And what we found was that a lot of these stressors influenced metabolic and nutritional response pathways that were also responsive to differences in diet and specifically differences in the availability of um, pollen in the diet. And, uh, and if bees were fed pollen in their diets and not just a, a sugar-based diet, then they um, were more resilient to these stressors. So we and our collaborators have seen this for um, pesticide exposure, for pathogens and parasites. And there was a great study from Gloria de Granny Hoffman's lab that also found the same effect for viruses. And, uh, and so the question then became, um, could we sort of figure out what are the best nutritional resources for bees um, and then encourage ways to have these included in the landscape? And so when we think about pollen-based diets, this is not sort of a trivial question because um, there's many different flowering plant species and they all produce different kinds of pollen that vary not just in their shape and color, but also in their nutritional value. And so um, sort of trying to answer this question became the, the focus point for the thesis of Anthony Baudot when he was a graduate student in the lab. And so Anthony made this little chart of the uh, sort of the, the nutritional qualities of pollen, and it has a lot of micronutrients, um, but it also has these two main macronutrients that bees need, which are protein and fats. Um, other studies have shown that the concentrations of proteins and fats in pollen varies dramatically across, bee, across plant species. Um, and several studies have shown that if you feed bees different pollen from different plant species, you get different health outcomes. So Anthony's hypothesis was that um, bees were foraging across plant species to optimize the protein lipid ratio that they obtained from the pollen. So they weren't maximizing the amount of protein they got or maximizing the amount of lipid, they were actually trying to balance these. And to, uh, to test this hypothesis, he used bumblebees for his studies because um, they can forage really well in enclosed arenas, which is what we needed um, for experiments. 
So we selected a group, groups of native plant species that had high, medium, and low visitation rates um, of bumblebees in a previous field study. And we put these um, plants inside an enclosed arena and then monitored, bumble monitored bumblebee foraging to these plants. And Anthony did a lot of controls in this. So he moved the plants around so that the bees wouldn't remember where the plants were. He controlled for the amount of floral area on each plant and he controlled for the amount of bees that were foraging. He also uh, hand collected the pollen from these plants and then analyzed its nutritional content. And so overall, um, what he found when he did these comparisons um, was that the carbohydrate concentrations, the protein concentrations, the lipid concentrations, and the protein to carbohydrate ratio were not correlated with visitation rates at all, but there was a significant correlation between the protein lipid ratio and the visitation rates. Um, so this was very interesting, but of course, all these plants also have many other cues that they're using to attract pollinators, including the shape of the flower, the color, and the scent. And so to look to see how much nutrition was really driving this, um, Anthony then conducted a series of experiments where he removed the floral cues and he offered um, bees in cages, uh, hand collected pollen from these same plants or pollen that had been modified to have different protein lipid ratios or synthetic liquid diets. And uh, what he found was that even under these conditions, the bees still preferred diets that had a five to one to 10 to one protein lipid ratio in the pollen. Um, and more or less than that was not preferred. So it did seem as if they were um, selectively choosing particular diets to, to um, optimize this ratio. So recently, um, Anthony worked with a, a very large group of collaborators who had been doing these similar analyses um, in different plant species. And we put together this um, paper that describes the protein lipid ratio from 82 different plant species. And here you can see it's arrayed out into the different plant families. And you can see that there's a lot of variation um, in the, the protein lipid ratio across these plants. We also looked at the pollen that had been collected by bumblebees, um, osmia, which are orchard bees, and honeybees. And what you see is that they seem to be collecting different ratios of pollen. And so that would suggest that potentially um, bee species are looking for different kinds of um, protein lipid ratios when they're out foraging in the field. And this might help shape plant pollinator interactions and give us some idea of how we should structure our plant communities to support these diverse species. But one interesting question I think is, is um, how much variation there is in these foraging strategies. So particularly for honeybees, um, because honeybees are active throughout the year, they go through different life cycles, and they also have a foraging strategy where they um, are sending out scouts to find the best foraging resources, and then those scouts will mass recruit to those resources. So it's not like individual bees are sampling everything. Um, they're using social information to find their, their forage sites. So to look at this in more detail, um, Tyler Jones, who's a graduate student in the lab, um, did a, a project working with many uh, beekeepers in Pennsylvania where the beekeepers donated uh, pollen from their colonies that were collected every month over a period of two years. And, um, and when bees collect pollen, they're usually collecting it from a single plant species. And so you, they'll have a pollen ball that um, will be of a particular color and usually again coming from, from a single plant or a small number of plant species. And so Tyler uh, collected these pollens and separated out these pollen balls into different color categories and then weighed these and measured the, the nutritional content of these pollen balls. And this is just a sample of what she found. Um, for five of our apiaries, you can see that individual pollen balls that the bees were bringing back were really spanning a very large protein lipid ratio uh, range. And so it wasn't that the bees were all collecting sort of a, a medium ratio, they were collecting across this whole range. Um, and as a whole, the colony might be collecting um, within a sort of five uh, protein lipid ratio of about five, um, but how they got there was really different. And so um, we still need to sort of think about this and try to understand if the, if the individual bees are just getting what's available to them and then uh, the colony as a whole is, is um, trying to, to balance this ratio or if the individual bees are working on balancing this ratio. And there's some work that was done by Sharoni Shafir's lab recently that showed that for different uh, types of lipids, the bees do seem to adjust their foraging strategies to have a balance of bees coming into the colony. So this still leaves the question of, you know, what are the best foraging resources for honeybees um, in a given area? And so we were interested in answering this question in urban areas. Um, and this was a study that was led by uh, Doug Sponsor when he was a postdoc in the lab in collaboration with Don Shump, 
who's a beekeeper in Pencil in um, Philadelphia. And uh, Don has a number of rooftop apiaries, which we used in the study. And Doug um, placed weights under these different colonies so he could collect weight data on an hourly basis and then also collected the pollen to look at the, um, the species that the bees were foraging on. And what he found was that there's three parts of the season. There's a spring flow, a summer dearth, and then a fall flow when the colony is gaining weight again. And when he looked at the, the species of plants that were contributing to this, there's also uh, very clearly three different plant communities. So there's a spring plant community, which is mostly flowering trees, a summer community, which is um, herbaceous weedy plants, and then a fall community, which is shrubs and woody vines. Um, and this paper should be coming out soon. It's open access. So if you want to take a look at what those plant species are, you can find out more information there. So I know you guys are all thinking this now, which is basically, I really don't have time to measure exactly, you know, how my colony is changing weight um, and what plant species it's bringing, it's collecting, um, it's foraging resources from. So how can I find out if my landscape has good forage quality for bees? So to help you answer those questions, we've developed a, a new tool, um, which is online called Beescape. This is in collaboration with a number of different institutions, different people and supported by a number of funding agencies. And basically with Beescape, um, what we hope to be able to do is to help people um, who live in complex landscapes like this one here, um, get sort of a, a basic understanding of the amount of seasonal floral resources available to bees, the amount of nesting habitat available for wild bees, and then the overall toxic load of applied insecticides. And so our collaborator Eric Lonsdorf um, and Maggie Douglas developed indices um, that use land use patterns to uh, create these these scores, um, and these are now available on Beescape at either a three or a five kilometer distance. Beescape right now works for several states from Wisconsin to New York, but we're hoping to make this um, national in May. And so just to kind of show you how this works, so if you go into Beescape and you drop a pin at your apiary site, in this case I picked a site right outside of State College, which is where Penn State is, and you'll get um, scores for your nesting quality, insecticide load, and then your spring, summer, and fall floral quality. If you're within Beescape, you can see whether these are sort of high, medium, or low scores. As a comparison, we can go and drop a pin outside of Urbana-Champaign, which is where University of Illinois is. And if we compare um, across these two sites, we can see that um, State College has higher nesting habitat, lower insecticide use, and then higher floral quality um, than Urbana does uh, because there's a lot of agricultural land here. So of course, if you're from Penn State, you say, well, clearly this makes sense because um, you know, the area around Penn State is better for bees than the University of Illinois. But if you're from University of Illinois, Alex and Jean are now asking, well, how much do these landscape indices actually predict bee health outcomes? Um, these are great rules of thumb, but do, do they actually translate into more diverse and healthy bee populations? And so we're um, working on answering these questions with wild bees. Um, and I can say that uh, there is indication that the forage and the pesticide indices do correlate with, um, with these different health metrics, but there's a lot of species variation here. For honeybees, um, we did a study using data that was coming from the Pennsylvania State Beekeepers Association looking at winter survival over the last three years. And the study was led by Martina Kolovi, who's a postdoc, and our collaborator Sarah Gosley at the USDA. And interestingly, um, their results found that these landscape indices were not really um, predictive of winter survival, but rather weather conditions were important. So if over the last uh, growing season you had sort of cool conditions or very warm conditions, the winter survival was less. And so since um, Beescape doesn't include any weather conditions at this point, we created a new tool called the Bee Winterwise Decision Support Tool, um, where you can see uh, what the, uh, at your particular site, um, how the growing degrees and the, the season accumulated over the last couple of years and what the predicted outcomes were, and then also you can track it for 2020. And so in this particular case, you can see that um, this location seems to be a bit cool overall for bees, um, and, it's, and thus there would be predicted to be lower um, survival. Right now, this tool only works in Pennsylvania, but you can go into Beescape and tell us how your bees did over the last year, and then we can um, add this information into our models and be able to, uh, to, to expand this to other states. So finally, if any of you are interested in, in understanding what you can do in your particular um, backyards to help bees and other pollinators, we have a lot of information on our Center for Pollinator Research website on how to develop pollinator gardens. Um, we have online beekeeping classes. 
um, and then also information for growers on how to how to practice um, integrated pest and pollinator management approaches. With that, I think I thanked everyone. Um, we've had a lot of great collaborators who have helped us with this. Well, I'd like to thank on behalf of the audience, all of our speakers for great talks. They deserve a hearty round of applause. And I think we all hope uh, that we get to the point in time when we'll be able to do that. So thank you very much. Um, be safe, be healthy, and take care. Bye-bye.